Thank you for having me here today. And you heard my name is Terry Murphy. And my niche in photography is rock and roll. I shoot live bands on stage. I do audience shots too, depending on who's hired me to do that. I posted today that I was going to be here. And I said I was a little nervous. And my friends took that to mean that I was nervous because I was uncomfortable speaking in public. I've won trophies for public speaking, that's not the reason. I was nervous because I feel like I might be here under false pretenses. I know you guys are all expecting to get a dissertation on how to use a camera and all the different settings and the little nuances of technical photography. Well, that's not me. Because the photography I do, you've got to find what works for you and use that because you've got just that long to get the shots you want to get. In fact, my mantra for the last 20 years of doing this has been take the shots you got. It's great to wait and try to get the picture with the pose and the lighting and everything just the way you want it. But you've got a split second to get that shot. So once you've found settings that work for you, you want to use those. Uh, I know you're interested in equipment. Let me bring that slide up. This is my rig. It's a Canon 70D. There's nothing unusual about it. I use a speed light, 430 when I use a flash at all. 90% of my photography is without a flash. Mostly I use a flash when a bar is hired me and they're interested in crowd shots. Because the lights on the stage is usually enough, depending on the stage. Sometimes they got three lights and that's it. You're going to use a flash. You'll notice I have a diffuser over the factory diffuser on my flash. Because you wash out the color if you use a deep flash. I've got a Tamron aftermarket lens, comparable to the Canon of the same uh, style, but it was half the price. <laughs> because I like my hobbies, my semi-professional hobbies to pay for themselves, money is always an issue. Anyway, that's it from a camera perspective. It's the only rig I use. I've got a series of cameras lighting a shelf at home as I progressed up through the professional rigs. I'm at this, I'm saving up for a Canon 5D Mark III which is more camera than I've ever had before. Mm -hmm. And next slide, the, uh, my settings. Uh, about five years ago, I was reading an article written by a very well-known rock photographer. And at the end of that article, he published what he considered the best settings for concert venues. Now, because people were always asking me what my settings were, and I got tired of telling him it really depends on where I'm at, what band I'm shooting, what the lighting's like. I finally cut this out and pasted it to the side of my computer. And every anybody asked me what settings they should use for rock photography, I pointed at this. I wish I could recall the author's name, but I can't. But this is as good as I can see. Anything. However, he recommended photographing it raw. That's great if you're going to take four or five pictures and have a lot of time to edit them. If you're going to be like me where you photograph four or five bands in a weekend and they all want their photographs tomorrow, you can't afford to take 15 minutes per photograph to edit. So I'll photograph a JPEG and just use the edit to clear it up. It's an issue. It's a little bit more great, but it's an issue. All right, like I said, if you were here for a deep dissertation on camera settings and things like that, I'm not your guy. I photograph rock and roll. I'm going to talk about how I do it. I figured I'd tell you guys my method of photographing a band. And if you decide to give it a try, as James has, it might help. I have a next slide. What constitutes a great photograph? Everybody has different opinions. Uh, this band, Mitch, has written three books on the subject of photography. And as I look through what he considered the components of a great photograph, they pretty much jive with what I was thinking. We've got the subject. In my case, it's a band or a band member. Composition, we all know what that is. It's how you frame your shot. Give me in thirds, but it's not necessary. The moment, and this is the key component of rock and roll photography, is the moment that like that. You've got that split second. I'm going to show you a couple pictures later on and I'll explain what I mean by that. You've got that split second to capture that image because it'll be gone. 
no matter what you consider the components of a great photog photograph, put them in your head and then picture them all moving at the same time in different directions. That's live stage photography. Your subject is moving, your light is changing constantly. You're usually in a crowd that's moving you around. You can't stabilize your camera like this. You gotta keep your elbows in because there's people standing all around you. All right, uh, emotional impact. What James said about my photographs, and I appreciate that by the way, is what you try to capture when you're shooting rock and roll. I don't care how clear your image is, how well it's lit or anything else, if the subject of that photograph does not look at it and think, wow, I'm glad I look like that, you haven't done your job. And it is a job. Bands pay me to do this, venues pay me to do this. The value I add is how they feel about my photographs. The best compliment I get on my photographs is I look just the way I think I do. We all have an image in our head. If I can capture the image my subject has in their head of themselves, I've done a good job. Uh, that, like I said, emotional impact. I would add to this a couple of things. I would add to this personal focus. When you're shooting rock and roll, as I said, you're always in a crowd, there's loud music, changing lights and all that. You've got to be able to center yourself and exclude all that. I'll tell you an interesting story. I was at a place called The Broken Ore, which is an outdoor venue. I'm shooting a band called Friction. I know all the guys. I take a couple shots of the band. I turn around and get a shot of the crowd. But I've got my back right up against the stage. As I turn back around, there's a microphone in my face. The lead singer decided I should sing the next verse. <laughs> the problem was, I was so focused on what I was doing, I didn't know what song they were doing, let alone what the next verse was. And the third most important thing is nobody wants to hear me sing. <laughs> <laughs> if I had any musical talent whatsoever, I'd be on the stage instead of in front of them. <laughs> so I would add focus. I would add, oh, uh, well, I had this all in my head a minute ago, now it's a long <laughs> We'll talk about it as we go through the pictures. Have the uh, first photograph, please. This young man died a couple months ago, unexpectedly. This is what I mean by capturing the moment. This is Tom Finley. The guy behind him is Russell Dean. It's a band called The Veil Side. We had a club in Wisconsin called The Outhouse, Route 20 Outhouse. And these guys move all over the stage. That guitar came up. Russ got behind him that fast. Russ is back on the other side of the stage. We were in motion, but I got a pretty decent shot at it. It looks better on my Facebook. <laughs> I have next slide. There you go, that's fine. Lead singer of another, oh, thank you, that helped a lot. Lead singer of the next band that same night. He was buff, obviously. I didn't like this picture as much when I first saw it because you can't really see his face. Turns out he loved this picture. He used it for his profile picture on Facebook for months after it happened. Black and white is very impactful. It's important to know what the band does. If you're going for that is the other two things I was talking about. <laughs> it's important to know what the band does because it matters on what kind of image you present. This was a heavy metal band. So he didn't care if you couldn't see his face. He cared that you could see the emotion he was trying to convey. Same band, different perspective. I love the lighting on this. You'll notice I shoot a lot in black and white. It helps me convey what the bands are looking for. 90% of the time I've had that I've shot in a lot of color, the bands have said, why don't you shoot more black and white? It's very impactful and it kind of harkens back to the early days of rock and roll photography. And black and white film was cheaper, so the guys that were shooting rock and roll used it. <laughs> Next slide. If you have any questions during this, please feel free to ask. Halloween night, a club called Penny Road Pub. Another heavy metal singer. And he loved this shot because, again, you can see what he's doing. He thought it caught the essence of the song. Again, it was a scroll picture for a number of months. 
We're going to go through these fairly rapidly unless you've got a question about any of them. Did you use flash on that one? The, the one back? Yeah. No, actually there was a pair of uh, floods at the bottom mm -hmm. that were coming up and down. They were moving them up and down. And I just happened to catch it as the floods crossed across his face. Close there wasn't enough. I'm very hurt. How close were you when you shot that? I was close enough to get sweated on it. Okay. <laughs> I, I was I was here. <laughs> nice thing about that particular stage is well most stages nowadays, there's usually no photographic pit in most clubs and bars. Mm -hmm. So you can get very close. I've been sweated on, bled on, vomited on. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeffrey Tate of the old Queen Break once poured a bottle of water on my camera deliberately. He survived only because I knew both the promoter of that show and the bar owner. <laughs> Next slide, please. I love this shot. Who is that? Crucified Hard Rock. What band was that? This band is called Circle Switch. Okay. And he always performs without a shirt. You, you may notice that it was cold in there that day. <laughs> <laughs> But again, uh, just capturing the light right, I love the way this shot turned out. Turned out he didn't care for it as much. He liked the other shot when the mic was up. Next slide, please. Drummers are always difficult to shoot. They're at the back of the stage, they're higher than everybody else, and they're hiding behind an instrument that is enormous. And the better the drummer, the more enormous his instrument is. I mean, this is a fairly small wreck. But again, I caught that light just as it hit him. We're going to talk about those lights in a few minutes. Next slide. Not a great shot. But I like this part of it. This is one I kept because I liked it, not because I thought it was a great shot. And sometimes you'll find that. Nobody ever jumped on this photograph and said, oh, that's a great shot. It'd been a great shot if I had just maybe couple more watts of light. But I included it here because with drummers, sometimes that's the best shot you're going to get. This is a stage where I couldn't go on stage and take pictures. So I'm at max zoom and just click my way over the best. Sometimes you get, this is a flash shot by the way. I was bouncing the flash off the ceiling in a club because he was back in a corner and there was no lights in that corner. The uh, light bar was out. And I really wanted to get that shot. It's a band called uh, J.B. Campbell and the Redneck Romeos. I know he doesn't look like a country player, but that band's actually got music on the radio right now. Next shot. Again, not a great shot, but the band seemed to like it. I like the movement in his hair. I wish it had been a little bit sharper. But it's one of those shots I'm standing there like this. And I see him go into that pose, and I swung around and clicked, and that's what I got. This is uh, T.D. Clark, a band called Poison Crew. And he's probably one of the best at finger tapping on a guitar I've ever seen. He does a solo in the middle of one of their songs, where he stands in the center of the stage and pulls that guitar off and starts doing that fingering. I was just trying to get a shot. He liked this shot. He was doing it. He used it as a cover shot on his Facebook page for a while. Ross Rochelle, a band called Day Rollers. This is the uh, face of modern rock, in my opinion. These guys are going places. Got a great sound. They do originals and covers. And they spread their covers out across four decades. I've seen them do Beatles songs with their own twist to it. He liked this shot. I liked this shot. He was just about to start. He hadn't started yet. One of the things I like to do, <coughs> I'll talk about this a little bit more. So I like to get to a uh, venue early enough that I can both check out the stage and check out the band while they're doing their sound check. Because they're not focused on their instrument, they're looking out, they're watching the sound guy. You get a shot like this. Same band, this is the whole band though. This was at a different club. The first photograph was from Home Bar 
This is back at the Route 20 outhouse. I really like this one. Next slide. Do you, do you splash in this one or just in the No, this is just like Route 20 outhouse has got great lighting. Mm -hmm. They've got two banks of uh, stage facing lights mm -hmm. and they're staggered. So one's higher and the other's lower. Mm -hmm. So when those lights flare, we're going to talk about timing in a minute too. Uh, when those lights flare, you wait for it. This is a band called Infinity. Uh, they used to do the TSO show, the Trans Siberian Orchestra show. Uh, this is not that. But again, it was one of those things. The uh, lead guitarist ran over and stood next to the rhythm guitarist. I think just to screw with him while I was trying to finger pack it. And again, it's not a great photo photograph. Uh, his hand is blurred. But it has the visual impact I'm always looking for in my photography. Ah, her name is uh, Rochelle, lead singer for a band called Slide Fishes Circle. Oh, oh God, it sucks to get old. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, I honestly don't remember the name of her band. But this is one of the few times a band member was actually posing for. She was on the stage performing, but she saw me taking a picture of her bass player, and she came over and she's going, come on, take my picture. And again, I just came around and click, you've got that, take the shot you got. I took it, came out pretty good. Oh boy, I don't even remember the name of this band. It is not local here. <laughs> is it something of empires on this drum? Anchors of Empires, thank you. <laughs> uh, they were a second band. I was there, I was paid to shoot the first band, and I hang around just to shoot the second band. But as you can tell, it's not a great photograph. I included it because I didn't want to see one of them breaking. <laughs> Next now, in this, why would you say it's not a good photograph? What to you is It's not, not as clear as I want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not framed very well. I cut off the headstock of the uh, lead guitarist. Uh, it's just, just not the shot I want. Mario's back from shaking his head. I can tell him he's having a shot. Yeah, at least he's dying. <laughs> Next slide. A little bit better. The hair band. In rock photography, we call this a hair gas. <laughs> and it's very difficult to do because you never know exactly when it's going to happen. But the guy with the really long hair will go like this, and then all of a sudden they throw it all back. And if you can catch it when it's just right, it makes a great shot. And that's the reason I included this, because it's not a great shot of uh, Rochelle. Next slide, please. Lights. This is no flash, no filter. It's just the way the stage lighting lit him up. And I thought it had a lot of impact. And he liked it, too. It's okay, can we? <laughs> Another hair gasm. Mm -hmm. I love to capture the interaction between band members. Mm -hmm. I have told bands repeat. I started doing this 20 years ago with one of the first digital cameras, an old Minolta box that took three and a half inch discs. <laughs> We got 10 shots to a disc, you used to walk around with a pocket full of discs. Because, and I started evolving a theory about bands, but it works for photography too. I tell bands all the time there's four relationships you have to consider when you're considering performing. Your audience wants to see your relationship to the music, how the band relates to the music. They want to see, on an individual level, your relationship to your instrument. And I've got a guy hugging that guitar with his eyes closed, and you can feel that he's feeling that music. You see that? They want to know about your relationship to each other, how the band relates. If the band doesn't look like it's having a good time, the audience isn't going to have a good time. And lastly, the relationship between the band members and the audience. I photographed bands that were great musicians, but they never related to the audience in any way. They didn't look at people. They didn't kill with people. They stood there and played man that was brilliant. I mean, it was just breathtaking to listen to. But 15 minutes into their set, 
people are headed for the bar because they did nothing to relate to the audience. All those principles apply to my photography also, slightly different ways, but they all do. Jeff, this is the band Friction I was telling you about. <coughs> Jeff's got a big kit. If he wasn't standing up, you couldn't see him at all. Really great guy. Again, I don't consider this a great photograph because his hand is blurred, but he just struck the symbol with his free hand. And uh, I like this shot. Some of you guys might know this band. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you know this? Mm -hmm. They're a great band. Uh, this was their fourth lead singer. Uh, his name was, Mary, you remember what his name was? He didn't last long, he was a little bit of an egomaniac. <laughs> Like some of the rest of the band. <laughs> well, this, this band is uh, probably one of the most successful mm -hmm. local bands you're ever in. Richie there doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, doesn't gamble. All he does is music and business. But uh, this band made $300,000 in 2009 just from the music. That was a select crowd. Yeah. I don't remember what Richie was doing. Richie's a pick master. He can hit somebody with a pick from 20 feet away. I know because I've been a recipient of that. <laughs> he stuck one to my forehead once because he keeps them in his mouth. Mm. So it's not the most sanitary thing in the world. Next slide. Did you just 30, 30 songs yeah. in Did you just photograph Yeah, I know I hate that. Did I'm you sorry. just photograph them at the turkey testicle? At the what? The turkey testicle? No. <laughs> no, this was uh, the broad stop. Oh. Oh, sorry. Yes. I see a lot of your pictures have like some nice, clear color to them. A lot of the bands, they seem to have blues and the yellows and the reds. How do you not have that in your photos? Are you you don't. How do you, because a lot of your photos don't have that. This so happened, I happened to catch it when the front cans were all in white. Do you like count off, like pay attention to how they're like, bouncing and hitting? Absolutely, it? thank you for asking that question. Uh, one of the things I like to do, as I said, I like to get to a venue early enough that I can do certain staging type things. I want to look at the stage. I want to see how high it is. I want to find the access points to get on stage if I need to. I want to find the high ground if possible. Maybe it's standing on the main speaker. Could be a staircase. Could be whatever. They'll let me get down on the stage a little bit. I also look at the lights. Every stage is different. So I look at where the lights are placed and what their focal points are. I also look for moving lights. You've seen them, they look like little light cannons. They move back and forth and up and down. Because I want to do that. I want to assess how they're going to affect my photography. Then, once the band starts, I time the lights. You're absolutely correct with your question. I time the lights because it seems random. But if you watch it long enough, you'll notice a repeating pattern. Most uh, sound guys also run the lights. So they've got it programmed in how the lights change. Sometimes you find lights that respond to the music itself, but most often it's programmed. So I'll know after a couple of, well, after half an hour, which lights are going to flare when, and I can see a pattern. Pink light, yellow light, flared white. That's when I time my shot. Again, it depends. It's no good getting the light if the guy's just standing there. <laughs> but if the guy's down in a rock god pose, and you get the flare at the time, you get a good shot. Nicky Bell, one of the hottest guitar players I know, plays a kind of uh, rock, blues, fusion kind of thing. Incredible guitarist. This is a stage called Wire in Berlin. And he wasn't the featured performer. I was there shoot a band called... Jeez, I know I should have written all this stuff down. In any case, Nicky was in the audience, and they called him up on stage to do it and I got this shot, and I really loved it. I like the color. See, this is the, I don't mind it's not natural light color because that stage light, there's no flash here. You take what you can get. Sometimes it's impactful. Sometimes it's distracting. I've been on, at a gig where the light guy sets the lights on blue, and that's it. I spent four hours photographing Smurfs. <laughs> <laughs> or the worst, though, is hot pink lighting. Because there's just no way to get a good five. Photograph and have been playing. So I went and talked to the sound guy and said, Could you change the lights just a little bit? Give me some white cans in front and I'll be happy. 
Usually if you're polite to them, it's a polite case will help you out. Sometimes, no, sometimes they won't even talk to you. Look, I had tried to throw, have you throw out. They said you've got 40 lights, use more than two. Mm -hmm. And you talked to the manager, and the manager said the band's paint yet. <laughs> Do what he said. Next slide. This is not a stage shot. This is not a band I photographed. I was standing outside the Penny Road pub having a cigar. And I watched this young lady who was a lead singer for a heavy metal band being posed by another photographer. This string thing here is actually a wall-mounted uh, hammock. They just put it up as a display. And I kept saying, pose in there, pose in there. I'm not saying it out loud to myself in my head. Finally, I walked over to the other photographer, the lady, and I said, would you mind if I posed her for just one shot? Oh, and I asked the uh, subject, do you mind posing for one shot? She's on a flight of stairs. I had her back up against the wall and put her hand on the net because that was the shot I was seeing in my head. This is the shot I got, and she really loved this. It's the only photograph I've ever taken. Ordinarily, I use standard Canon utilities to crop or adjust uh, contrast, or sometimes to adjust the color. Mostly, I don't spend a lot of time on any one photograph, because if I photograph a band, I promise them at least 150 shots. So if I spend even two minutes on each photograph, mm -hmm. it's a lot. It takes a lot of time. This, however, uh, Brian Durkin, yeah. uh, lead singer for, which band is Brian Lake around? Love Blast. Love Blast, thank you. It was a bad photograph. It was dark, and I kept lightening it up. And you can see how grainy it got. But I finally liked the effect I got, so I kept they're not all great photographs. I mean, I'm not going to say I take 150 great photographs. But if I get 10 great photographs out of 150, the man still gets 150. Because it's not always the pictures I like best that the subject likes best. I'll go through 25 pictures and I'll say, okay, this is the one this guy's going to use as his profile picture. Half the time, no, it's one I didn't care for that much. That he's using. His tastes are different than mine. I give him a variety. That's value of next slide. Cat. Uh, she used to be with a band called Girls Night Out. This is back at the broad stop stage, which is a high stage and it's usually very well lit. But Cat, because there was four lead female singers, was way off on stage right. And the light wasn't very good. So I got this shot. I liked it, she liked it. Some people have said, well, it's not a great shot. And I said, yeah, you're right. But it has impact. She is a metal doctor. And with all that hair there, two hours of extensions every show. Next slide. Nick Cox of, jeez. Uh, Seven Thank you. <laughs> I apologize. My memory is the worst by the day. Nikki plays uh, lead and rhythm, does some singing, and ordinarily he's difficult to photograph because his expressions are odd. And again, because I'm charging for this, odd expressions, no matter how good the photograph is, is not going to get me hired again. I like this shot, I like the lights, the impact of it. Lots of smoke, in addition to everything moving, the subject, the lights, the crowd, Smoke is an issue. Sometimes it's a benefit because you get the light beams. Sometimes it's so thick you can't see. I shot at the home bar band called TNT Chicago, who in addition to the club's two smoke generators, brought six of their own. Fifteen minutes into the set, they set off fire alarms. They kept, their, they had their smoke generators on a timer, so they kept going on. The entire set, the fire alarms were going off yesterday. You said you shoot wide open, but I see quite a bit of depth of field. I'm sorry. Yes. You said you shoot wide open, but I see pretty good depth of field. Uh, single point of focus on my Canon gives me a pretty good depth of field. Not a great one, but pretty good. You can tell there's blur here. If there was somebody standing behind him, you couldn't make out the pictures. But if you set your camera for single point of focus, 
that you can lock the button and move your focus slightly and get that depth of field. Excellent. You're Richie. I love this shot of him. He's sort of a pixie personality on stage. And I really thought that expression captured it. Yeah, he's looking down, and there was a uh, light cannon, moving light cannon, at this side of the stage. And as it swept back towards him, I got it just before it hit him. You can't see the beam, but you can see the beginning of the light. Mm -hmm. I find this a very impactful point. Lead singer. I don't remember what he was doing, but at the time, it was hysterical. That expression. <laughs> I think it was Nicky, Nick Cox, who was standing to his uh, right, had thrown a pick at him or done something else, and he'd given that look. It doesn't always have to be the music. It was talking about the relationship between band members. When you watch Seventh Heaven, you know these guys enjoy what they're doing. Every second that they're on stage, they're having a good time. If I can convey that with my photography, I'm as tough. If I can, uh, we'll see a picture of some members of Vale Side, one of my favorite original bands. And these guys are like a litter of collie puppies when they're on stage. They're combining, they're separating, they're standing next to each other. At one point in time, the bass player and the rhythm guitar speak each other, and they're strumming each other's instrument. It's not as dirty as it sounds. They're strumming each other's <laughs> instrument. <laughs> And they don't lose the beat. Ah, this band no longer exists, although components of it still are out there. One of the nice things about shooting rock and roll is four years ago, I'll shoot a band, there's five members. A year after that shoot, there are five bands with each one of the member I know. And the following year, it's sort of a geometric progression. <laughs> Anyway, Dan Langer, Lang Langer, lead singer of a number of bands. He's great to shoot because he so emotes so well. There's never any downtime. There's never any neutral expression on his face. He is raging the whole time he's on stage. Nicky again. This is a shot I liked a little bit better. But you can see what I mean about his expressions. Mm -hmm. He is so into his instrument, so into the music. He is unconscious of what his face is doing while he's playing. So sometimes his expressions are kind of odd. Not as odd as some. I photographed some people you would swear that they were having some kind of stroke while they were playing. It was just terrible faces. Take every good decent shot of them. I really like this one. Next shot. Uh, this wow. is how close were you? Again, this was like this was at the uh, no, this is at uh, Tailgaters, mm -hmm. yeah. Bolingbrook. So I was maybe five feet. Mm -hmm. I was down the stage. I believe Singer would have been right about here. <coughs> and I was probably shooting here when Nikki came to the front. And I pivoted. That's the reason I got so much of the headstock forward. Uh, and again, I was probably at reasonable extension of my lens mm -hmm. at the time I took the shot. But there just wasn't time. He was going to move. In less than a second, he was going to move. He would back, he'd go stand behind the bass player or something like that. He never stands still, none of them did. So it's my mantra, take the shot you got. I often think, boy, if I just got a little bit more time, but it's gone, just that fast, that shot. And you can tell I really like these guys. Pajama party at Q Bar in uh, Glendale Heights. They didn't tell, they told the lead singer that it was a pajama party, but none of the other guys wore pajamas. The <laughs> audience was in pajamas. That's cool. And some of them were quite risque. He showed up in footy pajamas. <laughs> Flannel footy pajamas. Do you know how warm the stage gets? <laughs> <laughs> At one point in time, I'm not sure we've got this picture. Give me that picture. <laughs> no, go back. Do you have the freedom to roam around the stage while they're playing, or no? It depends. Again, part of the prep work I do before banding hits the stage, is I get there, I check out the lights, I check out the stage, I talk to the sound guy, and I meet the bands. I give them my card. I tell them who I am and what I do. And I ask them, 
would it be a problem if I come up on stage? The only way you get to sound a drummer is to get up on stage. Some say, no, we don't want anybody on the stage, and that's fine, it's their stage, but it's money. Some say, sure. If you do get up on stage, do not take root. I've seen guys get up on stage and stay there for 40 minutes. They're wandering around, they're standing behind the singer looking on their shoulder, they're standing in front of the drummer taking pictures. Get your shots and get out. Nobody paid to see you on stage. How do you keep from feeling like you're a disturbance for the audience, though? I'm sorry, Liz? How do you keep from feeling like you're uh, in the way of the audience? Since you're well, that's a great question. I do have an answer for you. Uh, again, part of the prep work I do when I get there, if you're shooting a big band like Seventh Heaven, people line up in front of the stage 45 minutes before it happens, mm -hmm. before the band even hits the sound check. So what you want to do, at least what I do, is I go and take pictures of the people in front of the stage. I pose them, I take the picture, I show it to them, tell them how good they look, tell them where I'm going to post it. I'm going to make friends with the first 20 people in front of the stage. Because then when I'm trying to worm my way through the crowd, the people in front will actually step back and let me get a couple shots. Mm -hmm. Because they know I'm a good guy. Mm -hmm. And I don't stay in one place very long. Okay. Because if I take Rudy even dead center in front of the stage to take all my shots, there's people behind me that are going to be annoyed. I've been told I was annoying. And I've been punched, kicked, stepped on, had a beer pill poured on me. It's part of the charm of having a lot more lifestyle. <laughs> Next shot. This is one of my favorite shots. Uh, and again, I cannot remember the name of the band. I had all this stuff in my head earlier today, but I'm old. As you can tell, the singer there is posing for me. The bass player, however, was not. And just a fortuitous front lights came up. The smoke fired out, and I got it. A split second later, it was too foggy to shoot these two. The fog was just starting to come by them. Smoke, fog, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is an oil-based uh, smoke generator, which means the smoke goes high. You've got a cold, dry ice generator, the smoke stays low, and that's very cool effect sometimes, too. I like this. I even like this. The other thing you want to look at when you get to the stage is microphone and equipment placement. That'll not only tell you where the band members are going to be, so then you can track your lights to where the microphone is, but it's also, uh, it was referred to by somebody who was very big in photography, but not rock and roll photography, as stage clutter. There are amplifiers, wires, tape, and microphones and stands. Now a stand like this isn't too bad, but if you've got a player who offsets his mic, so it stands here, he offsets his mic over here. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind that you're only going to get shots from this side. From this side, you've got all this iron work in the way. So you figure out your place. Part of the stage assessment you make when you get there, okay, this guy's got a right angle on his microphone, so I'm only going to be able to shoot him from the left. You still try a shot from the right. Nice, nice thing about digital photography, is it doesn't cost anything to take a bad shot anymore. Back when it was filmed, the film was $10 a roll, and you got 19 shots, and it cost you $5 a piece to develop them, you couldn't afford to take a bad shot. But now, I don't like that. It's gone. Bingo. Next shot. I got this while I was shooting the first band. The second band was setting up, and the lead guitarist was sitting there tuning his instrument. And there was something about where he was sitting and how the lights from the stage were going. That made me stop and turn around and just get his picture. It's not a great picture, but I just kind of like it. It shows that relationship between the man and the instrument. Lead singers. Again, I didn't, I should probably have prefaced this whole display with saying I didn't spend a lot of time going through my 100,000 photograph retention on my 7 terabyte hard drive looking for my best shots. I grabbed a bunch of shots from the last couple of gigs I shot, and that's what you're getting to see. I didn't really look for the best. I looked for some interesting shots, but I could go through my retention and probably pull up several hundred that would make you go, oh! but that would just be right.
Ah. Trios are especially tough. It's because you want motion. You want to see them interact. You want to see them do things. You want to see them get the rock god pose. You want to see them play the guitar behind your head or stick the headstock between the lead singer's legs. You want to see all that. Trios don't do that. The guitar player is tied to his pedals, so he can't move around a lot. The bass player is usually a little bit freer. In this particular case, the bass player was also the lead singer. But he had a great look, and I really liked the way this photograph came out. Don't be afraid if you're shooting rock and roll to just shoot here or here. It's okay to shoot here. Sometimes you have a little impact. This was off center, and I was about like this when I took the shot. Doesn't affect the shot at You can always straighten out if you have to. A friend of mine who takes, I'd say, great amateur photographs, but she doesn't really sell them, took an image of a female lead singer who had one foot on the monitor, that's the speakers in front of them, and she's leaning way forward. In its original composition, it was not much of a photograph. She rotated it, spent a lot of time editing it, and it was a breathtaking photograph. I would include in the technical photography category all those editing wizards that can do such amazing things <coughs> with paint or Lightroom or Photoshop. Again, I don't have the time to do that or the patience are probably to scale. So, I really like Soul Patch Monkey. This is the trio. Because it's the trio, I got one player here, one player here, and I got a clear shot at the drummer. Unfortunately, as you can see, he's got a pretty big rig. This is actually during the sound check. And you can tell his focus is on the sound booth. Because he's probably banging away on his kick drum while the uh, sound guy's yelling, give me more, give me more. So that was that focus, and I really like that. Good shot. Lee guitar, same band, Soul Patch Monkey. This was the guy who was tuning his instrument in the earlier photograph. He's a very quiet player. He's one of those guys where I could draw a chalk circle around his feet at the beginning of his set, and I'd be willing to bet that the chalk is not speared by the end of the set. He plays and sings and he doesn't do much. The guy in the top hat's all over the place, though. Next shot. I really like this one. These two, I believe, were dating at this time. I don't believe they are any longer. But you can definitely see there is a man who is feeling it. They call it sustain. I, I, Mario probably knows what I'm talking about. You hit a note and the guitar continues to vibrate for a while. He's feeling that sustain. He's feeling that vibe. And I'm not sure what she's feeling, but she looks happy. <laughs> <laughs> Next shot. This is the band Bale side I was talking about. This is a very early photograph. It's actually about four years old. I only have it in this group because it recently came up in my memories. On Facebook, you know, it said, your memory from four years ago? And it allowed me to track this down. This was two cameras ago. I was shooting a Rebel TSI can at the time. Not nearly this powerful. This is the old Shark City stage. It was in back. If we go to the next slide. This is a, thing. This is a photograph I was going to tell you about. I took this shot, and the next day I sent a PM to Tony. That's Tony Engels, lead singer for Bellside. And I said, Tony, I got your new profile picture last night. I said, you've never looked this cool before, you'll never look this cool again, but you look this cool for one second, and I froze that moment forever. I know for a fact, Tony had this picture printed at eight and a half or eight by 10, and gave it to his mother for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> he also used it as his photograph in three of the liner notes of three of their CDs. So he really liked that shot. And in truth, he's not that cool. <laughs> <laughs> but he looked cool there. <laughs> There, there he is. You can see he's got that cool anymore. <laughs> this is the same night, though. Russell D is a great guy to photograph. He is so demonstrative and so emotive when he plays that you can just actually spend the entire night following him around the stage with the camera, just taking a picture of him. And unfortunately, I've seen that happen. Where a photographer is gets so caught up with one player, you look at their shots the next day and they've got 30 shots. 25 of them are one guy, and five of them are the rest of the band. You can't afford to do that if you're going to get paid for it. You've got to find great shots 
of each player. I love these guys. If you ever get a chance to see Valeside, I can recommend it highly. Their original music is catchy and toe tapping, and the few covers they throw in are Valeside all the way. They manage run rub their own funk on each song they do. They're a version of uh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> 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 ah, John Dobbs. This is a band called Cover Dogs. John's also a great guy to photograph because he emotes so well. You can tell he's feeling that music. Some guys don't. They don't change expressions at all. There's a guy named Dan, something with a B in, in the Dinsky. Long name, 16 consonants. Um, Great guy, Juilliard Train, a classic guitarist. He can do things with the guitar that just amazing. The problem was he had short hair, he showed up for gigs and pressed blue jeans and a blazer. <laughs> and you could watch him play, and if you're an experienced audience member in rock and roll, you could tell that he was incredible. But if you were not, you'd think he was about to nod off. Because he never changed expressions, he almost never looked up, he never related to the rest of the band. You didn't relate to it, doesn't matter how good an instrument, instrumentalist you are, if you don't relate to the audience, you're not going to catch it. He moved to Texas recently. Not John, but Dan. It's a band called uh, Vicious Circle. Uh, these guys are great. They do original music with a 70s flavor. If you like late 60s, early 70s rock and roll, you love these guys. And it just so happened that they were doing these really pain in the ass circle lights at the time. These are revolving spirals of light behind them. So you've got to count the lights again until you've got a face. This guy is so shy. You wouldn't believe it. Really nice looking kid, great player. But every time I point a can at him, camera at him, he hides his face. Well, I do think I got a couple of decent shots of him. Vince, however, is real. Uh, the term we sometimes use in rock and roll is camera horror. You point a camera at him, he loves it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you know? Again, that's stage lighting. Uh, I don't have a problem with stage lighting when it's like this. When it's all one color, if it's monotonous in that color, then it becomes an issue. But this, bands like it, I like it. So, you know, it all depends on what you like. Rock and roll photography is not for anybody, everybody. I've had professional wedding photographers come out and try to do this. I should be at home bar, and the father of one of the players of the band I was shooting at, professional wedding photographer. He took about four shots and he walks over to the camera and he says, why are you doing that? Because it's different. Nothing holds still when you're shooting rock and roll. Have like 2.8. You're going to have to start up there. If, if, it's you, if you're all, you know, if you're at 2.8 and you're trying to have more focus, that's been my struggle, just trying to find that focal point and have more focus. Otherwise, it's such motion blur, it's like, ugh. And then you oh, yeah, and I get a lot of that. And you're just I call it hit rate. I'm showing you pictures that I chose to keep. Mm -hmm. If I take, if I come up with 120, 150 pictures that I choose to keep, you can bet I took 300. Because you do get blurred. Sometimes it is impossible to freeze the hand of a guitar. Mm -hmm. It's moving so fast it's going to blur. Then you judge the impact of the whole picture, the emotional impact, the visual impact of the whole picture, and decide whether or not you can live with that blur. I mean, for every hairgasm I've gotten, I've probably taken 30 pictures until I finally get it up in the face that I can live with it. Do you spot metering? Like, is that what you're using? I'm sorry, you got to speak up there and I've got a lot of Do you use spot metering or what is the other one? No, you don't have time. You don't have time. Once they start to move, that's it. You don't have time to adjust your settings. You don't have time to adjust your focus. You don't have time to so you meet your, your focus. Pardon? You lock your focus in. And I have an auto focus. Showing. I use a single point auto focus. Right. And you lock so it in. if I'm, say, I'm shooting you, yeah. but I want to get the foreground. I'll lock my focus on you, right. then I can move the camera, you'll still be in focus. Gotcha. So that single point of focus helps that. If you got multiple points of focus, 
you can still get that blur. And you're gonna get the blur anyway. Yeah. It just matters sometimes <clears throat> if you're shooting somebody that moves a lot. I mean, I've seen some jackrabbit players. They're all over the stage, they're up, they're down, they're all over the place. Sometimes you just series shoot. You hold the button down, click, 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 like you're shooting sports. And hopefully somewhere in that series of 10, 20 shots, you got one where you do it. Do you ever stage them? I mean, I know you said that a little bit, but if you think that's going to be a problem, do you do any before shots? Like maybe you just have them stand there and then you take the shot before they sing? Or? You can't talk to them. Oh. They're, they're performing. No, I mean before they get on stage, though. Kind of oh, like sometimes. You know, I have actually had bands <laughs> move their equipment because I knew from knowing the stage that the guy on stage left was going to be out of light. For some reason, I don't know if it's deliberate or accidental, but 90% of the stages I photograph, the stage left is dark. Not completely dark, but it's darker than stage right or stage middle. So if I see the guy is way over here, and he got his mic stand there, I know he's going to be out of the light. There's only three people in front. I said, dude, move your mic over here. He said, I said that light. He did. He liked the pictures. Tom Kale. Uh, circle or uh, vicious circle again. Uh, difficult to shoot because of the skin tone. Uh, and that's not an ethnic thing. There are people of every ethnicity that are difficult to shoot because of their skin tone. And I, I, I don't know why that is. And I'll shoot a band, I'll get great shots of everybody but one guy. The one guy looks like Casper, he's so pale. Every shot. Shot off the flash, drop down everything. Still looks like Casper. It's just his skin tone. I like the shot. Tom liked the shot. He used it for his uh, liner notes on our CD release recently. Sometimes a band will pose for you. This is in the middle of a song. He's not just standing there waiting for me to shoot. I was standing there, and he noticed me and threw up the horns right in the middle of the song. Uh, he'd use this a lot. <laughs> he likes that shot. And I, I know you guys can't see it, but that's me right there. <laughs> Next shot. The drummer for Valeside, Ron Thomas. Tough guy to photograph. He moves fast. He's got two fans that blow from underneath his drum kit, and he's got waist length hair. So sometimes it looks like trying to photograph comes in. The only worst, the only worst drummer to photograph is the drummer for Convoy. You know Michaela G? Uh, is it still Lee? No, it's Michaela. Oh, no. no. He's got a full gray beard and hair comes down to here. Now when he gets going, everything's moving. <laughs> I've got maybe two great shots of him. And all the rest of them are blurred. Either his hands are blurred up. Drummers do not mind if they can see the track marks of the stick. They think that's kind of cool. But they want to see their faces. Because everybody's got an eagle. Next shot. This is a little bit better shot, Ron. Because the lights came up behind me just as I clicked. In a second, those lights would be pointing right at my camera. By the way, I shoot through the lens. I use a viewfinder, not the screen. And if you're in a venue where they have lasers, well, it won't blind you or seriously damage your eyes. If you catch a laser right into the lens when you're focusing, it will give you a headache like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and it also makes it difficult to shoot. You've got this big green, red, whatever dot in front of your right eye and the whole time until it wears off. This I was actually on stage for. Uh, Bob Hilton was the bass player, saw me standing on the stairs to come up on the stage. So he moved way forward so I had a little room. I stepped out, I dropped to a knee, click, 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 I took three shots, and I was back off stage. Small stage, Bob's a big guy and he's very demonstrative in the way he plays. It was really nice of him to give me room, but I wasn't going to give it up making the credit. I think that's it. Yep. Yeah. This is the color version, or is this this is slide we started? This is yep, yeah, that was it. Alright, that's it. Kill that. All right, like I said, my way of doing things. I do not mess with my settings once I get started and comfortable with them. Sometimes I'll drop my ISO 
down <coughs> what I'm getting. I shoot through the lens. When I get there, I do prep work. I look at the stage, I look at the lighting, I look at the placement of the stage clutter, the mic stands and the amps and stuff like that. Stage height is important too. Some stages like uh, Rod Stop in Wisconsin, it's an old style stage, but comes up to here on me. Taller guys get better shots, so I have to get back. But if I've got a crowd around me, that's tough. Little uh, story here. We're shooting a band called the Texas Hippie Coalition. Biker band, heavy metal out of Texas. And these guys are biker through and through. Their audience is biker through and through. I'm at the old Shark City, up against the stage, and then look at the crowd. There's 250 drunk bikers behind me. <laughs> and I am trying to get shot. <coughs> bang, bang, bang. There's a guy that's about six foot three trying to climb over me to get to the stage. Lead singer of this band is called Big Daddy. It's about my height, and it looks like me standing next to myself. <laughs> the real challenge with him is if you're close to the stage, he's not getting his belly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to shoot him, and bang, bang, bang. And I kept turning around and looking at this guy who's banging and he's huge and he's <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, do your prep work. Get there early enough to meet the band. Introduce yourself to the band. Two reasons why you want to do that. You want to give them something that'll tell them where you find your photographs. Because you might not sell any photographs up front, but if they look at your pictures on Facebook, decide they like them, they'll start calling you. Second, you want to meet the band because you want to ask them if it's okay if you come up on stage. Great shots sometimes from behind the band at the audience. If you time the lights right, you'll get some great shots. Same from behind the audience also. Get the people with their hands out, your cell phones up. You can get some great shots that way. You want to meet the people standing in front of the stage. Because some of them, as I just told you, can be surly. So you want to make friends with them. The best way i found to make friends with them Talk with them, take their picture, show them the picture, tell them how good they look, and say, you know, I'm going to need to get here in a little bit. Would you let me in when I come? So when you worm your way through the crowd of 100 people or whatever's in front of the stage, when you get up to the front where people are most territorial, tap somebody and show them, hey, can you get here for a minute? Get a couple shots and you move on. So you don't upset anybody. Although, I have, like I said, I have been told I'm annoying sometimes. Because I'm a pretty good, a big guy. I take up a little bit of room. And when I'm doing this, I take up a lot of room. <laughs> and I'm not adverse at times to uh, giving somebody that's crowded me a little too much and all the uh, I should say a word about rock and roll mosh pits. I had a split lip from, and a black eye and broken glasses from accidentally wandering into a mosh pit. Where we get overage juvenile delinquents deliberately banging into each other hard enough to draw blood. And if you're a photographer, and as I said, I tend to get very focused to the point where I have audio exclusion when I'm photographing. I'm backing up and I'm taking pictures and I'm really digging it. I'm having a good time. And all of a sudden, boom! I take an elbow in the cheek. It's hard enough to split my lip because I wasn't watching where it was My wife actually bought me t-shirts to say rock hard photography. That's what I go by, rock hard photography. And across the back, and the letter's about this big, it says photographer. She thought that might help if the huge professional rig doesn't, but it seems to. And sometimes you just get in this. I literally had a girl about so tall jump on my back while I was photographing a band, just so she could rage at the band. <laughs> Security, she needs to leave. Uh, if you're like me, you go to a lot of bars, you get to know, I don't drink. But I go to a lot of bars. The bars realize the value of my photography because they always tag the venue. So they get they get the shots. They realize that's good advertising. The bands realize the value of it for the same reason. They get their shots. They put them on CDs, they put them on t-shirts, they put them on posters, they put them on their Facebook page, they put them on their web pages. So everybody gets value. Even if I'm not hired by one of the bands, I can still walk into those venues without paying a cover. Uh, what else? I know there should be a lot of things I should be telling you guys. What else can I tell you? you got any questions? Yes? So you said earlier that you don't want to spend too much time editing pictures? No. Do you have any, any time issue with noise when you go 3200 on ISO? Sometimes. 
And if it's, okay. if it's so not something just, I can correct rapidly, I just delete it. All right. So like in editing, how much time? Less than two minutes on each picture? Or yeah. you just grab and go? It depends on the photograph. If, if, if I've got 150 pictures to edit, and I've got to get the disc to the band by Wednesday, because they always have to have it by Wednesday, I don't know why. Uh, then I can't afford to spend that kind of time. But sometimes, uh, I wish I thought to bring it. Very early in my career, I got a shot of a band called Midnight Road, a bass player and lead guitarist back to back. Nice and close, it was framed perfectly, but it was way dark. So there's adjusting the contrast, my wife said something to me and actually slammed the contrast bar all the way over. Well, as I'm bringing it back, I get this incredible image, not a great photograph, but it's an incredible image of the two of them. It was the cover of their last CD before they broke up. So yeah, sometimes I'll adjust that much, but mostly it's just not practical for me. I have a friend named Eddie, they call him Absolute Eddie, photographer. He'll go to a venue and get six shots, and he'll spend a lot of time editing them, and they're incredible, powerful, emotional images. But he takes three weeks to do it. If I take three weeks to get my discs to the uh, band, they've forgotten they hired me. So it's just not practical for me to spend a lot more than two minutes on a photograph. You know, you earlier said you shoot most of the time with JPEGs, not raw. So did you run any time in a problem when you cannot fix um, the light or anything because it's All a time. JPEG? Okay. My hit rate, what I call my hit rate, is the number of photographs I consider worth keeping versus the number of photographs I don't. Usually runs about 50%. Mm -hmm. The tougher the venue, the higher it goes, the better the venue, the lower it goes. I get 80, 90% at a venue like Broad Stop or Tailgaters where they have great lighting and they really know how to use it versus some of the smaller venues where they got four or five lights. And it, it just goes up and down. But yeah, there's always the delete button. I've never deleted so many pictures that I couldn't provide a band with what I promised them. But I have deleted a lot. Do you watermark all of them? Pardon? Do you watermark all of the pictures that you get? I don't watermark any of them. I don't own the photographs after I give them to the band. They do. That's nice. Do you put your info in the file? Pardon? Do you put your info in the file? or no. Nothing? It's their photographs. The, the problem I've run into, I took pictures of somebody for their dogs and I sent him the files because he's a friend of mine and then I did a Christmas card of this <laughs> overexposed blown out Walgreens card and then he posts on Facebook, thanks Charlie for taking your photos and I'm like seriously that's a piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not what I shot. So that's you have to that's, that's again, none of what I'm telling you folks is engraved in stone. So you I'm just telling you what I do. Most no of my problem? Is there a way to lock them down so people can't edit them? I guess that's my question. No. At least I don't know. Okay. Barry, was there a way to lock the photographs so it can't be edited? No, I, uh, I watermark everything. I own all the copyrights because of that reason. Oh, that's one of them. Um, and uh, depending if they buy a high resolution copy, you know, everybody signs a contract. Yeah. You know, and it's a, it's, a, it's a mutual respect that thing. You know, this is what I'm providing you with. You know, when you're agreeing to X, X, and Y term. Uh, if they need something additional, different size or whatever, then we address that, you know, when the time comes. But I try to avoid that because it can be a problem. I think you're selling your image, they go to Walmart. Yeah, you but know, can't you put stuff. it copyrighted in the file? Yes, I do. Yeah. But at the same time, you, know, you tell them, like, you know, you may not uh, crop that right. out. Right. Because some people will do that. Yeah. And that's you can easily problem. erase exit information. No, but I'm talking about the file information. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Oh, I didn't know. Very easily to do, yeah. Right. If you bring the Photoshop, blank it out and save it as something else, it's gone. Uh -huh. so, so it's hard. A lot of times this is just kind of the honor system with people. I do sign contracts with everybody because that's, that's what I do. You know, it's yeah. not a hobby. Mario is much more business folks photographer than I am. My contracts are all word of mouth. And, you know, I get there, they have page me, I take the pictures. I've always, since 20 years ago when I first started this, I always told every band I photographed, I work up with 100% money back guarantee. Mm -hmm. You don't like the pictures for whatever reason, for any reason, for no reason, I'll refund you money. But you can pay one band, 
You mean paid up front? Yes. One band take me up on that. And it was a promo shoot, those are stage shots or portrait photography. Uh, and the band looked at the photographs and they came back to me and said, we can't use any of these. Maybe I could understand that, maybe not. But there was no question. An hour after I got that note, their check was in the mail going back. Because I don't want a band saying he cheated me or he didn't provide money. I don't want to this money. Now, what about if they used your, like you said, the one guy used his uh, sleeve or whatever, one of the photographs you did on his cover? Oh, they use them all over. You go into a music store yeah. and look at strings and find Bob Hilton's bass strings, one of my photographs is there. Find Russell Dean's guitar strings, one of my photographs is there. See, that's the difference between me and a lot of photographs, photographers, is I believe that once I've taken a picture and sold it to the band, I have the right to use it any way they want. I mean, but the guy who sold you his car, your car doesn't tell you how to drive it, does he? The guy who made your lunch doesn't tell you how to eat it. I'm a photographer. I take your picture. What you do with that picture is entirely up to you. It's just, maybe it's a different mindset or whatever, but it's worked for me for all these years. Of course, I'm not trying to make a living out of being a photographer. I enjoy being a photographer. I like the fact that my photography will pay for itself. As you know, you get a finite amount of photographs out of the lens. I've had lenses freeze on me during a shot. It's a $700 lens. So I need to know I've got $700 that I made a photographer to replace it when it needs to be replaced. For past that point, like I said, I'm not trying to make a living out of this. Yes? I think one of the things that you and Mario were kind of talking back and forth and everybody's hinting at is the blend between passion and business. Yes. You know, if if your goal isn't to buy a forty thousand dollar car, not that Mario's is, but you know, with your photography, then you you can be you know more free with your licensing. Absolutely. Whereas somebody who's got to pay their mortgage exactly. is going to be a lot more restricted with their licensing. But the truth of the matter is, once you've given them an image, even if it's low res, low res is good enough for Facebook, and you can go back to them and say, hey, listen, we didn't you know agree to that, but they got the image. So it is an honor system um, it is. a lot of the time. And if you give them a high res image, you have almost no control. They can edit it as much as they oh, yeah. want. They can print it out. Walmart technically won't print out professional photos, but they do. And they don't ask. Going back to my example of the band that did claim my refund, they already had a disc of high resolution photographs. Yep. They had all the photographs they took during that promotional shoot. And, you know, I sent them the money back. I trusted them not to use those photographs. Mm -hmm. And believe me, had I seen them use those photographs, well, the last thing you want is a little fat Irishman to come at you in the dark. I had a technical uh, question. Do you, um, do you try to calibrate your camera for white balance before you walk into a video, or do you just shoot on it? I shoot auto with white balance. OK. Do you want to fix yeah. that in post ever? Pardon? Your, your white balance in post ever? No. Okay. Uh, you, you cal like I said, I showed you what settings I think are ideal. Mm -hmm. But you calibrate your camera when you first get there as part of all the prep work. You look at what you got, you figure it out. You may make an adjustment after 15 or 20 minutes shooting. Well, bear in mind, when you're shooting, look at the lights not only for their placement, but whether they're incandescent or uh, LED. Bear in mind that the first three songs on LED lights, the lights will not be at their full strength. So you've got to wait for that. The first, the first couple of songs, the stage will appear darker than it's going to be if you wait for two or three songs. It takes a while for them to come up to full strength. Can I answer your question? Yeah, that's good. I have a question. If you have any tips, you know, when, you, when you're shooting these dark rooms, you've got these can lights and spotlights everywhere, it seems to be my disaster in a lot of shots. I avoid them most of the time. You've got to time those lights, like I said. 90% of the time, those lights are computer run. Mm -hmm. So they will run on a pattern. If you watch them long enough, you will discern that pattern. You'll know when the side cans are going to flare. You know when a light will go from yellow to red to white. And if you've already figured out where the lights are pointing, all you got to do is wait for a shot. I, I've stood like this for a full minute, waiting for the light behind the guy I'm trying to photograph to flare. I want that flare because you've got smoke behind him, so I'm looking for that 
or visual time. The time will eventually will figure it out. It's not something that comes easily. My, uh, my process has developed over 20 years. Yes? Single shot all the time, that multi shots? Depends. Uh, again, uh, you were talking about the young lady who was back there a little while ago. I made Siri shoot, which is a put a button on my camera to go from a single shot to a Siri shot. And it's just like sports photography. It's they're moving really fast and they're always moving really fast. You got all that. Bear in mind, they're not just moving like this. I call it the rehearsal stance. Bass players and drummers are very closely related because they're both part of the rhythm section. When bands rehearse, the drummer's back here, the bass player's standing here, but he's watching the drummer. And that becomes such an ingrained act to them that they'll do it while they're on stage. Even though I've told them and told them and told them, the band or the audience is not going to see your ass. Don't stand like that. They still do it because it's automatic. They're playing a song and it's got an intricate rhythm part. They'll turn and play. So they're, they're moving back and forth. They're moving side to side. They're turning around. They're doing everything. So you've got to watch them. Because they will, again, just like the lights, band members, never mind these guys didn't date in high school, they sat in a room and practiced the rock god pose. So they've got a series of motions that they go through that they know looks cool. So if you see, you're at the other end of the stage, you see the back, go down on one hand, boom, 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 boom. and you think, damn, I missed a great shot. Wait for it, he's gonna do it again. Listen to the music, one of the reasons I don't wear earplugs is the reason I'm having a hard time hearing your questions. And if you listen to the music, you'll know when he's gonna do it. So you can read that in this stage, and, you can do this. and don't hesitate to take five or six pictures of that. I have it often. Click, 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 as I'm walking, because then I can go back in the edit phase, first pass of the edit phase, and say, that's blurred, that's not a good expression, that's okay, this is better, and I'll keep that one. Answer your question? Yes. Sorry, I don't know. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I saw the original setting that you are somewhere between, what was it? Under 100 of a second, or yeah. something like that. How can you not have a blur over there? That's Seems almost, in, you know, I mean, 1, 125, but anything under 100 of a second, it must be really close, especially when they, you know. It movies. seems to work. Uh, like I said, I am not the best person to ask about technical photography. Mario's probably a thousand times better than I did that. Uh, it just seems to work. He's always shooting an 18 to 55 line, so um, mm -hmm. technically you could do it all the way down to 70 to 60 to 50. Uh, okay, lots of practice, I guess. A lot of elbows, <laughs> that guy, he got very strong elbows. Like, like shooting a pistol. <laughs> Bring it all in, it stabilizes. Anybody with a last question? We good? Good. Yeah, right. But I ask you. Can I ask you here? Can I get everybody up here so I can get a picture? Ah, oh, sure. In the rock eye pose. <laughs>